You guys can take a seat and uh, grab a Bible or Bible app, open up to the book of Matthew chapter 7. It's where we're going to be at tonight. My name is Robert. I'm the family pastor here. And again, we're just glad that you guys are here, specifically if you are at our Parker McCulloch campus. We're just really excited that you guys are joining us here today. And and we're glad to have you guys here at our Sweetwater campus. And and as we kick into our message tonight, um, I want to invite you to think about something. Uh, And maybe a time where you purchased something and later found out it wasn't exactly Exactly what you were expecting. Now, maybe this was this was something that a salesman kind of oversold. Maybe this was an advertisement on TV that overpromised and underdelivered. Maybe it was one of those too good to be true eBay deals that turned out to be just a fake from China. Or maybe you bought a car that was from a Nigerian prince who promised it was in like new condition for a great price. Um, or any number of these things. Or maybe it's just something that you bought that turned out to be a piece of junk. And see, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the the times where that's happened to me, and I don't know about you, but it seems like every time I've had that happen, it's because I didn't take the time to fully investigate and look into that situation. Maybe I was rushed, maybe I just was a little impulsive, maybe I didn't know enough about it, and I just jumped in and later found out, hey, this wasn't what I was expecting. And, and, and it sucks because you spend more time and money making up for that mistake than if you would have just done it right from the beginning. And, and so we've learned, you know, or you go broke uh, doing this over and over, and you learn that you got to do your homework. When you're, when you're doing that, that big purchase, that big decision, you got to investigate, you got to look into it, right? And our culture has this statement, this Latin phrase, caveat emptor, which means let the buyer beware. Uh, this originated in the 1500s in England as a way to, to tell buyers, hey, it's your responsibility to make sure that you're getting what you need. Now, laws have changed, you know, corporations can no longer rip people off just because they feel like it. Like, they're legally required to have a marketable good. But that, that, that underlying theme is there, that it's our responsibility to make sure we're making a good decision. It's our responsibility when we're buying the car to make sure we lift the hood, we take a look at things, make sure that we're reading the Amazon reviews of the things we're going to buy, and it's our responsibility to do that. And here tonight, as we're kind of wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to challenge us to do a little investigative work also. Not not on a car we're going to purchase or on Amazon, although if you're on Amazon right now, no judgment, you know, get that, get that shopping done. Um, but he's, he's calling us to do some investigation on our life. And for the last few weeks, we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, which is going through just different areas of our life, our relationships, our faith, our character. And tonight, he's going to kind of start that process of wrapping us up and kind of asking the question, what are we going to do with, with what we've heard, what we've seen over the last few weeks? So uh, Matthew chapter 7 is we're going to be at. Verse 15 is where we will begin. And it says this. It says, Beware of false prophets. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered by thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the deceased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a deceased tree bear good fruit. For every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits." See, this is a little, a little change of pace from the rest of the Sermon on the Mount here uh, of, of what Jesus is getting at and what the purpose of this is, because the rest of this has been fairly light in tone of just saying, hey, you've, you've thought about things this way, let's rethink. And here he's really, he's really getting pretty pointed and direct. And, and the big picture that he's wanting us to see here is that we need to follow the right people. That, that as we look at the people that we're following, what we're doing, the people we're allowing to influence our life, we need to make sure we're following the right people. And see, he, he references false prophets here. Now, a little, little background here for, for those of us maybe that aren't as familiar with the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the, there's this kind of position that one could have called a prophet. And basically what that was, it was someone literally called and sent by God. They would go to a community, to a group of people in Israel. They would go and they would remind them of their covenantal obligations to God. Basically saying, hey, you guys have said you're going to be God's people. Here's what that means and then the next part would be, here's how you're failing at that. 
and what you need to do to fix it. And so they would come, they would literally speak on behalf of God, and they would say, hey, here's how, what you guys need to change, and then they would prescribe blessings or curses based on how those people chose to respond. You know, if they repented and turned back towards God, they would say, okay, this will happen. You will receive this blessing. If they continued in sin and disobedience and rebellion, they would say, here's the curse, here's the punishment you guys will get. And so obviously this carried a pretty significant weight of authority, responsibility, and power as one's literally speaking on behalf of God. So with that also came a lot of counterfeits, a lot of people that decided that they would be a prophet. And they were not actually called by God, but they would say they were. And so the the Old Testament actually spends a a fair amount of time talking about how do you discern a true prophet from a false prophet. And and, and there's some some different passages on this, but I want to share Deuteronomy 13 as it it dives in uh, to a specific area. Deuteronomy 13 says this, if a prophet or dreamer of dream arises among you and gives you a sign or wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and says, let us serve them, it says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer of dreams. He goes on to say this a few verses later. He says, you shall walk with the Lord your God and hear him and keep his commands and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God. So it takes a, a little bit of a serious turn at the end there. It's like, oh yeah, P.S., that guy, yeah, you need to kill him. But, but as you work through that, he's got a couple different instances, or, or actually one specific criteria for how you evaluate a false prophet. And it isn't, you know, does the prediction come true? Does his sign or wonder come true? Because elsewhere it talks some about that. But he's saying, no, above anything else, the thing you need to evaluate is, do they call you to go and worship and follow after other gods? Because at the core part of that responsibility of a prophet is to call people to draw closer to God, to call them to a deeper place of faith and trust and obedience to the one true God. And so if a prophet is not acting in that capacity, he is out of alignment and, a, and obviously a false prophet. Now, what does this have to do with us today? Because Jesus, he's talking here, and and we're saying that that this is applicable to our life today. We don't have the the role of prophet in our life today. Um, We are not in covenantal relationship with God in Israel because we're in Arizona. So what does this have to do with us today? Well, Well, we don't have people coming on the street corners reminding us of our covenantal promise to God, but we do have a lot of people that speak into our life. We have a lot of people that, that want to call us to action, that want to instruct or guide us. And, and, and some of those are very healthy things, and some of them, as Jesus points out, are not. And he's calling us to, to have discernment, to investigate, hey, who are the people speaking into your life? Who are the people that are, that are influencing you, that are teaching you, that are instructing and guiding you? And, and, and as we do that, we have to look at it, the fact that they don't always look like dangerous people on the outside. You know, he says these false prophets, they, they come in sheep's clothing. They look like they should be there. The, the people that are speaking into our life that aren't good for us, they don't look like dangerous influences. He says they, they come in sheep's clothing, but, but catch this. He says, in, but inside they're ravenous wolves. See, a false prophet doesn't exist to feed the sheep, but to feed off of the sheep. In the same way that those people that are, that are trying to influence us away from Christ, they look like they're for us, they look like they're a positive influence, but inside they're really trying to just feed off of our life. And so what's that look like for us? See, when we, we first read this passage, a lot of times we just go straight towards the religious side of things. And we think, okay, so this applies to pastors, authors, speakers, podcasters, stuff like that which is a good place to start. That's not all of it, but let's start there. Because the truth is that, that here in 2019, we have an incredible amount of, of resources in this category. How many of you, uh, aside from like Calvary, how many of you listen to sermon uh, via podcast, YouTube, website? So, yeah, so a good deal. Is, I know I've got three or four that I listen to that you know, are out of state, other pastors that I respect and look up to. We've got a lot of opportunity to hear other voices that no other generation has ever had before. 
But with that comes a lot of discernment that we need to take to know, hey, is this person that we're listening to, are they actually teaching well? Are they teaching sound doctrine? Are, are they actually teaching things based on Scripture? Are they teaching you about sin and repentance? Are, are they calling us to a place of deeper relationship with God and, and a, a more healthy trust and obedience to Him? But really the thing when we're looking at these teachers we have to evaluate is, are they calling us to follow them or to follow Christ? Because I've, I've, I've seen a lot of, of speakers and pastors and authors and, and, and voices in that realm that, that it really looks like they want me to follow them with a little side of Jesus mixed in. And so if you're one of those people that, that are listening, even, even to us here at Calvary, you need to be evaluating, hey, is this what you're teaching? Is this based on Scripture or opinion? And, and what's the goal is, is Jesus talks about the fruit of, of their teaching. Is it for you to follow them or follow after Christ? But see, that's not the only person, that false prophet in sheep's clothing that we can have uh, in the, the kind of the religious sense. It doesn't just apply there, but, but really gets at anyone that's speaking into our life. So it then gets into the people that you follow on social media if you're active there. The, the TV shows that you watch, especially opinion-based ones, the, the talk radio shows that you listen to and the opinions that are shared there, the, the authors that you read, the, the people that you're looking to, the celebrities and the opinions they have, it even gets into the opinions that you're following of friends, family members, coworkers, that discussion at the water cooler that's happening. Because if we look around, we have all kinds of people wanting to influence action, influence direction, influence belief in our life, whether that's a political thing, a, a fitness thing. You just talk to one person that's done CrossFit. If you don't believe me that they're trying to get you in, just talk to one person that's ever done CrossFit and you'll see it. And so, so it comes back to us, how do we evaluate that? Because when we look at, at this idea of false prophets, it says, are they calling you to follow after another God? You might be thinking, well, well, Robert, no, they're, they're not calling me to worship Satan. They're not calling me to worship after another God. They're, you know, and that might be true. They may not be encouraging you to worship Satan or to, to start, you know, worshiping the Old Testament idol and false god of Baal. But I don't think that, that it's as simple as that. Because when we look around, we see all kinds of options for things that we can worship besides God. In fact, anything that, that we put all of our time, energy, devotion, affection, and finances in, if it's in that place of first priority, it can become a false god for us. And if we're not careful, we've got people around us that may be well-intentioned that are trying to influence us in that direction. And they may, may, may be influencing you to worship other gods like the god of self, they're saying things like, man, you just got to make yourself your first priority. You got to take care of you. You got to make sure you're taken care of before anything else. And it's all about you, your dreams, your aspirations, your desires. They may be encouraging you to worship the God of fame and, and, and popularity. Of Man, you've got to go chase after that dream. You've got to make something of yourself. You've got to get out there and, and, and put your stamp on the world. They may be encouraging you to, to follow after the God of, of fitness and image, and man, it's all about, you know, you, the, the look, the, the appearances, the brands, the labels that you wear. They may be encouraging you to chase after the God of success and wealth, saying, man, you've got to really get that, that, that garage filled with toys. You need to worry about the address of your home and the, the, the amount of zeros in your bank account. Or maybe it's not even as obvious as those. Maybe it's something smaller, like the God of perfection, the God of safety, the God of our children, the God of retirement. The people that are speaking into your life and influencing you, where's, what's the fruit of that? Where is it going to take you? Are they influencing you closer to God or closer to a false God? Because this is, this is on us to investigate, to, to evaluate, to make sure that we're going in a good direction. Because see, last week we saw uh, just a few verses prior, Jesus talking about our life and the fact that we have two paths as an option for us. 
We have one path that it says the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. That this is a, this is a paved road that looks great, that, but inside has really taken our life to a place of destruction. But then Jesus shared that there's another path, another option. It's narrow, it's a little bit more difficult, but it's the way to life. And that's following after and trusting in Jesus. And the vast majority of the people in our life are not going to be encouraging us to follow after that narrow path. They're going to be encouraging us, they're going to be cheering us along when we're taking another step down that road to destruction. And so it's on us to say, hey, am I following the right people? The people speaking into my life, influencing me, are they, are they for me? Or are they a ravenous wolf in sheep's clothing? Because not everyone that is for us really is. Not everyone who claims to be for God really is. And we have to look and investigate that. But Jesus says that's not where we have, that's not where we end, just pointing the finger and looking at other people. If you pick back up Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, he continues. And he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven Verse 22 says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. See, not only do we have to follow the right people, we have to be the right kind of follower. See, here Jesus really drills into us and this really is more about us than it is other people because Jesus is saying, if you really care about eternity and spending it with me, then you need to investigate how are you spending your life? What kind of follower are you now? And, and see, the, the challenge for us is, is that verse 22 where he's, he's looking at those outward actions. And, and for a lot of us, this is hard because we evaluate our spiritual maturity and progress based on our outward actions. And you hear that in, in that, that passage, these hypothetical people are like, hey, didn't we, didn't we prophesy for you? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do mighty works all in your name, all for you? If this was us today. Hey, didn't, didn't I serve my community for you? Didn't, didn't I serve as a deacon in the church? Didn't I lead that ministry? Didn't I invite that person to church for you? Didn't I lead that person to Christ for you? And see, the hard truth that Jesus has shown us here is those outward actions are not what matters. Those outward actions aren't where the significance of our faith and our life of following Jesus is. Jesus doesn't look at our life and go, okay, yep, they, they went to church this many times this year. They volunteered for this many events. They, they got involved in this ministry and leadership and stuff. Because if you read verse 23, it's really the key to this, this passage he says, I never knew you. And so what we have to understand is that, it's, that relationship matters more than the knowledge or the actions. He says, I never knew you. There's no relationship there. And if we care about being the right kind of follower for Jesus, we have to understand that, that it's more about relationship than our outward appearance or actions or lifestyles. So if you're here today, let me, let me just challenge you at this because you're one of the church-going people that he's talking to here. And even if you're like, yo, dude, I'm not really a church-going person. This is my first time here. Well, you, for the next 20 minutes, you're a church-going person. So stick with me here. See, it's so easy for us to, to, to look at our, our external life and be like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm checking all the boxes. I'm doing all the right religious things. But let me ask you, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you know him as your savior and does he know you as one of his followers? And, and if you're like me, you, you, you'd wanna play the semantics of that question and be like, well, if Jesus knows everyone, of course he knows me. But really, does he know you? Does he identify you as one of his followers? Because the hard truth is that, that self-labeling carries no weight in eternity. And so if you're not sure about this, let me challenge you to spend some time thinking about why you are here, where are you at with Jesus? Have you come to a place of, of saying, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. I've given my life, my, my, my everything to you, and I'm following after you. Because 
That's where this all needs to begin. That's where we have to, to look at for all of these, these truths, the that, that understanding that, that a, a life following Jesus isn't about the external but the internal. And, and if we really want our life to reflect this, we have to have the, a genuine process of following after Jesus. So what's that look like? First, it, it looks like us having an authentic life change experience. And, and, and what we mean by that, and we use that term here at Calvary a lot, a life-changing relationship with Jesus. We use that all the time. And that means that if you've decided to follow Jesus, change should happen in your life. There should be a transformation that occurs there. I mean, you look at uh, the book of John, chapter 3. Jesus is talking to a guy named Nicodemus, and, and Nicodemus is asking questions about faith and following and eternity, and he's asking these questions, and Jesus very early on introduces the, the concept of being born again, and he tells Nicodemus that he, if he wants uh, to have eternal life, he wants to, to have this, he has to be born again, and Nicodemus has this, this, this block because he's taking it literal and all this. But Jesus introduces the fact there that if we actually want to follow, there's a, there's a change that happens. And I'm not saying that there's, you know, you go from being a heathen to being, you know, the perfect person. That's a process. But there's a, there should be a change of our heart, our mindset, our, our, our ideas, and our, our motivations that happens when we follow Jesus. And this is where it begins. This is where it has to begin. And then the natural step two of that is it actually fleshing out in our life and it, it being demonstrated. Because if we've decided to follow Jesus and our life has changed on the inside, then it will be shown on the outside. And as we continue, then, then we're going to be confessing and repenting of sin. We're going to be reading and applying God's word to our life. We're going to be demonstrating that to the world around us. We're going to be changing our speech, our attitudes, our behavior, our decisions, our spending, our entertainment to better reflect Jesus. And we kind of come back to where we started in that verse 22 of our outward action looking correct. But see, the thing we have to catch here is that there's, there's a one-way street of how sanctification or us growing more like Christ happens. It only happens when we have internal transformation on the inside. But so often churches and, and Christians have promoted that if you just do the right things on the outside, then things will sort themselves out on the inside. And so if you're here today, and you're hoping that, that going through the motions here at church, showing up, maybe you're even leading in a ministry or volunteering in a high capacity, and you're hoping that that's going to change your life, I have bad news because it won't. The only thing that will change your life, the only thing that will transform you is a life-changing relationship with Jesus. See, the gospel, the good news about Jesus is not about behavior modification, but heart transformation. That when we give our everything to, to Jesus, he transforms our life, starting with our heart and, and flowing out into every action after that. And so he's, he's here saying, hey, guys, it's not about the outside, it's about the inside. It's about the relationship. So just like last week, we kind of ended with, with a difficult question and, and something to ponder. And, and tonight, I'm going to challenge you to, to again, take, take a question home with you. And that question is, are you playing church or are you truly following? Are you playing church or are you truly following? And that's a question that only you and God can come to the answer of. Because as we've said, we can't look at the outside. You certainly can't look at your neighbor or your family member and, and decide for them. This is, a, this is an internal you and God thing. But are you playing church or are you truly following? And see, this, this gets at what's the motivation for the, the, the actions, the activities, the decisions you make. And, and, and understand that what this looks like for us here at Calvary is, is when we look at, at, you know, situations and people, understand that we care more about character and obedience to Christ than we do simply biblical knowledge and religious activities. And yeah, biblical knowledge is important. That's why I'm literally teaching from the Bible right now. We do it every single week. That's why we want you involved in life groups. We'll, we'll be signing up for our fall session in a couple weeks. Uh, get involved in a life group so that you can grow in community and have support and encouragement. But it's about our character. It's about us trusting in Jesus first and letting that guide us. So are you truly following 
What is, what is your motivation for, for what you do, for how you live, for how you strive to be better? Because our hope and prayer is that the motivation wouldn't be that people would think better of you, that, that they would think that you're a better person, that you're awesome, or that leading in ministry wouldn't be just so that you could be in charge of people. Because if, if you are your own motivation for, for doing these religious activities, know that the book of Isaiah says that even our best religious activities are considered filthy rags by God. But if our motivation is how God has transformed us, how we've been set free, how, how we've experienced an incredible amount of love and grace from Jesus, and we want our life to reflect that, then that's exactly what God wants from us. And that's exactly the, the life and the, the pattern that we are to live. Because in the end, it's not about how many times we went to church, how often we, we led in an area or a ministry, how many times we invited someone to church. It's about if we know Jesus as our Savior and He knows us as His follower. So today, is, is there fruit in your relationship with Jesus? Is there fruit uh, of that relationship growing and prospering and developing? Or is it the fruit of other people leading you in different directions and pulling you in different ways? Because in the end, if we want Jesus to greet us in eternity with well done, good and faithful servant, we have to understand that that only happens if we're actively trusting and following Jesus and growing in our relationship with him. Let's pray. God, we thank you tonight just for the, the love and forgiveness of Jesus the fact that he gave his life for us, the fact that we have been set free from sin, we have been set free from just the, the slavery to that, that road to destruction. And God, tonight, as, as we're here, we just ask that you help us. Help us to, to see the, the voices, the influencers that are in our life and how they might be calling us back to that road to destruction. And God, help us to, to narrow in on, on living in that, that path to life. And God, as, as we are doing that along the way, help us to never get caught up or trapped in, in the idea that what we do for you is more important than our relationship with you. But God, help us to, to prioritize that, that inward relationship with your son Jesus and growing and developing in that. Because God, when it's all said and done, we want to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Help us to, to follow after you and serve you along the way because of our deep and, and close connection with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.